occupancy. I think I didn't actually use the word fractional occupancy when we were talking about Boltzmann distribution, even though I may have like said it once or twice, I didn't bother to really talk about it. And in that case, it was talking about the occupancy of those energy levels, right? Um, we basically just called it a probability and moved on. Um, so this is something a little bit different. It's not as, I don't have to make quite as much the point to be like, this is different than this. All right, so let's define a parameter given by a lowercase f, okay, called fractional occupancy or fractional saturation. So those are the two terms we'll use. And f is equal to the concentration of protein that is bound to a ligand over the total amount of protein. So the concentration on top is the complex. That's the amount that's actually bound. And the bottom is the complex plus whatever's free. Okay. The total amount of protein would be both what's bound up and what's unbound. When fractional occupancy is equal to zero, there's no binding. Okay. All the sites are vacant. And when fractional occupancy is equal to one, all of the binding sites have a ligand attached. Okay, so what we want to do with our fractional occupancy equation is we want to plug in our dissociation constant. Okay. We're going to plug in k sub d, which is equal to free protein, free ligand over the complex. We want to um, rearrange this with the complex by itself. Okay, and then we're going to plug this piece in here into these up here. The fractional occupancy. Now, rather than looking like this, we're going to write it in terms of KD. So we're going to have free protein, free ligand on the bottom. I pulled the KD out. These can drop. Okay, so this piece here, this is the whole top piece, this complex here. And the bottom now has the P by itself. And then, of course, this is the complex again. I plug this into both parts. So we'll keep canceling and rearranging things. We have now free ligand on the top. Our bottom has our dissociation constant times 1 plus free ligand over plus P. And we can write this as just the concentration of free ligand over K sub D plus concentration of free ligand. Okay. So this expression is super important to us. Basically what it tells us, if our concentration of free ligand is equal to K sub D, then F will be equal to one half. Okay. When the protein is half <coughs> saturated, meaning half of the protein molecules <coughs> in solution have a ligand bound to them. And the 
value of the ligand concentration will equal the dissociation constant. So this is how we can obtain the dissociation constant. You know, how are we going to measure this? Okay, we are going to go ahead and we are going to have control. We have protein in a solution. We're going to add ligand to it at some known concentrations, okay? We're going to slowly increase that ligand concentration, and we're going to measure some change as the binding occurs, okay? So we might be able to do that with um, spectroscopy again. We might be able to do that with isothermal calorimetry or some sort of heat output as they bind. We might be able to do it with radioactivity as the example we're going to show in class today. Um, so, you know, the ligand concentration and some change as the ligand starts to bind to our protein are the things we can actually measure so that we can determine a dissociation constant between these two. Okay. Let's go ahead and um, plot our fractional occupancy versus our ligand concentration. This is a, called a binding curve or a binding isotherm. What do you think binding isotherm means? Just give the definition of isotherm and you're most of the way there. We're at constant temperature, okay? Isothermal meant constant temperature. So, it means that when we create this binding curve, okay, we're taking our measurements at constant T. It means that binding would fluctuate with T. And it means that K sub D is really only constant at a constant temperature. Okay, so recall the Van Hoff situation. Van Hoff said that you could vary temperature and look at the change in equilibrium constant by plotting the natural log of KEQ versus the inverse temperature. Okay. So again, our binding curves are always going to be for a specific temperature. Or if you see two binding curves that are labeled as at different temperatures, this is why they're going to look different. So we'll go ahead and draw our sample plot. And we have a concentration of our ligand here. We have fractional occupancy here. So down at the bottom, we have zero. At the top, we have one. And then we have our half saturation. Have a couple different curves. We have ligand number one for our receptor, and we can have some sort of ligand number two. Okay. And like I said, this is what we would collect potentially if we were we had some solution of protein and we were varying our concentration of ligand and we were measuring some output parameter, whether it be spectroscopy, radioactivity, whatever it is. Okay. So we could construct a curve like this. Um, and a binding curve is good for a couple of things. Number one, estimating KD. Okay, so we can get our dissociation constant for the binding between these two species. Okay, we said it's at 0.5. So here is KD for ligand one. And here is KD for ligand two. I can say almost definitively, you will be given a binding curve and asked to take information off of it, okay? If you are given a particular concentration of ligand, you could estimate the fractional occupancy. Okay, so say we're out here somewhere. You could say, oh, this is about that. I haven't decided if I will scan in these notes or the ones I wrote previously, so just be aware that the curves look different on the one previously. This is much closer to 0.7 than 0.5 in my drawing. 
on this one. Of course, there's some saturating limit. Eventually, you everything's bound. It's not going to go any higher. So this is maybe 0.95 or something. And then the third thing you can do is compare affinities. between your ligands. Okay, so out of one and two, assuming they're interacting with the same receptor here, which one has a higher affinity for the receptor, one or two? One. How do you know? It has a lower KD. The lower KD, the higher the affinity, the stronger the binding, right? I don't have units on here. There's some units of molar. Maybe we're in micro, maybe we're in miller, nano. I don't know what the order of magnitude is of my molarity here. Okay. But a lower KD means I have higher affinity. Okay. I saturate faster. Okay. As I increase that ligand concentration, I'm reaching all of them being bound. Okay. So this isn't really the form that your book shows um, ever, unfortunately. Okay. The way it's shown in the textbook. Um, Oops. This. Okay, so it still has your ligand concentration um, on the x-axis, but on your y-axis is the protein ligand complex concentration. Okay. And so the curve still looks um, hyperbolic, but now. This is F equals 1, this is F equals 0 0.5, this is F equals 0. <coughs> and this is some, some saturating concentration. So the hyperbolic relationship is the hallmark of one-to-one -one binding. If you run some type of binding assay and you don't get this shape, something more sophisticated is going on, okay? So you either have allosteric, some sort of, as one ligand binds, it affects something else. Um, so the hyperbola is the hallmark of one-to-one um, one -one binding. Like I said, basically, if it looks like anything else, allosterics are going on. Okay. And so I said that the way to measure this is with some type of binding assay. Okay. And so this could be um, spectrophotometry. You could use fluorescence, absorbance, radioactivity. But generally speaking, you're going to vary this concentration and measure some change as more and more of the light happens. So we're going to look at examples of those next. Any questions about that stuff? Yeah. 